Welcome, everybody, to the Rabbi Daniel Lappin Show, where I, your rabbi, reveal how the world really works. That's right. And, uh, you know, one of the ways the world really works is that people very often confuse cause and effect. Imagine, if you would, a visitor from a very primitive culture and he is put on an airplane from his remote island. I pick him up at the airport, and I drive him into town. He's going to stay with me for a few weeks, and on the way in, he seems to be absolutely amazed at all these things he's seeing for the first time, and eventually I say to him, so of all these amazing things you've seen, what is the most astounding? Thinking he'd say cars. But no, it turns out that for him, cars was just an unusual form of horse. It was just another way of getting around. And I thought it might be uh, the crowds. But no, you know, a hundred tribesmen or 10,000 strangers. It's a people are people. No, what astounded my guest from a remote and isolated island um, was stoplights. And I said, what about it? He said, well, one of the problems we have in our remote island is we sometimes find ourselves being charged by enraged elephants. And they flap their ears and they wave their trunks in there in the air and they emit these terrifying sounds of elephants trumpeting. And then they start charging us and the ground starts shaking like an earthquake and the elephant's feet thunder closer and closer. He says, if I could get one of these lights that flashes red and manages to stop big things in their tracks, they would totally change life on our island. And I say to him, well, you know, it's not really the light that causes the vehicles to stop, but, you know, I'm wasting my time. Not because he's dumb. He's not dumb. He's very smart. But he is so accustomed to seeing things in a certain way that it was it's going to take a long time to get him to adjust his thinking to the idea that the red light doesn't actually stop the car. The red light just indicates to the driver that he is expected to bring his vehicle to a standstill. But our visitor actually thinks that the red light is the cause of vehicles coming to a stop. Uh, sometimes doctor friends have told me that, um, that people who smoke very heavily or drink very heavily, uh, the patient eventually, the doctor says, look, you've caused serious damage to your liver from all this drinking, and I, you know, let's just hope that you don't get uh, a fatal liver disease. You, let's hope you're able to get get okay. Well, the person gets frightened. He stops drinking cold, just like that, on the wagon, no more drinking. And three weeks later, he's diagnosed with serious liver disease. And from then onwards, for the rest of his life, short as it may be, he's busy telling people, friends of his, former drinking buddies, whatever you do, don't stop drinking, because when I stopped drinking, that's what made me get ill. I was doing fine all the time I was drinking. Stupid me. I listened to my doctor. He said, I have to stop drinking. I did. Three weeks later, I'm diagnosed with liver disease. So uh, my advice is don't stop drinking because that's what causes the health problems, the stopping. Okay, simple inversion of cause and effect. Here's another one, and this is the one I really want to talk to you about. I only told you about the traffic light and the uh, alcoholic because I wanted to tell you about this. Most people think that clothing is the consequence of civilization. Did you hear what I just said? I, it's, it's a, <laughs> I'm going to say it again, not for you, for me. Most people think that clothing is the consequence of civilization. Most people think 
that as a primitive culture like the remote desert island that my friend with the elephant problem has, that eventually when they do encounter civilization, one of the things that happens is they start adopting clothing. And what we're going to talk about in today's show is that it's exactly the opposite. It's an inversion of cause and effect. It's clothing that helps to produce civilization, not the other way around. You should be feeling shivers of apprehension running up and down your spine. The hair on the back of your neck should be standing up because this is such a wild thought. That's right. If you wanted to bring civilization to my friend's tribe on this remote desert island plagued by charging elephants, then the first thing you have to do is bring them clothing. It's kind of interesting because, uh, as I'm going to show you, uh, it turns out that the Christian missionaries Uh, who came to different parts of the world, I'm thinking particularly of the Pacific Islands, but also to Africa during the 19th century, uh, one of the things they brought was clothing. And uh, today, in hindsight, many foolish individuals mock them. Oh, those Christian men, they imposed their way. Well, that's what brought civilization. The clothing was absolutely key. Is this wild? Well, it's so wild that you're laughing at me. You actually are laughing at me. Or you are you mocking me and scoffing me? That would be even worse. But laughing at me, I can tolerate because in a few minutes, I think you will be laughing not at me, but with me at the sheer joy and exuberance of discovering another timeless truth about how the world really works. You're going to love it. I think I love it. So let's start exploring clothing at its, at its most basic, shall we? Uh, let's take a look at the question of how you dress. Now, um, of course, in, um, in, in a little while, I'm probably going to try and do this discussion on a live broadcast, either on YouTube or on Facebook, and... Um, The way you can make sure that you know about it is to be subscribed at our website at rabbidaniellappin.com. And there we will be able to go into a more uh, a two-way discussion. But right now, as much as I would like to be able to get your answers and your responses, the best I can do is ask you to think about these questions. Ask them to yourself and give yourself the answers. And uh, and for my part, from time to time, I'll be sharing a thought experiment with you. But let's dive right into it, shall we? Uh, what determines how you get dressed in the morning? Is it comfort or appearance Or is it um, fashion and style? And perhaps many people would respond uh, a combination of all. Yes, I want to be comfortable, but I'm also aware of how I look and how I appear. Okay, fine. So you might want to give some weight to each one of those. Like, um, if I'm really, really comfortable, is that okay? Or do I uh, care, like, is appearance like 50% of it? Uh, comfort 50 or is comfort 90 and appearance is 10 or the other way around let me ask you this do you dress differently in the morning when you're going to be seen by other people as opposed to a morning when you're getting dressed knowing you're staying home all day do you dress different well that would give you some clue (laughs) wouldn't as to the answer to the first question do you dress differently when you're not going to be seen by anybody and by the way let me just salute um, wives everywhere, and you know who you are, wives who meticulously get put together every morning as if they are going to be making an appearance at Buckingham Palace. Well, perhaps not not quite like that, but um, uh, women who, even if they're not going to be 
seen by anybody for a few hours except their husbands. But nonetheless, well, you, you know what I'm saying. I, I know wives like that, and uh, it's pretty amazing. And don't think it's not appreciated. And gentlemen, if your wife happens to be somebody who takes the trouble to make sure that she is put together and looks put together first thing in the morning, even if she's not going to be going to Buckingham Palace on this particular day, uh, you need to admire and appreciate that very greatly. And uh, ladies, from our point of view, you cannot imagine how that enhances our lives, how that changes our lives. So um, how about dressing strictly for utility? Now, this was for a period uh, a part of uh, the understanding of socialism, the journey dress utility. When do I dress in a utilitarian way? Uh, one of my favorite things is, I know this is going to sound ridiculous unless you have come to know me over the last few years, but uh, every now and then I have the joyful pleasure of boating. And when I boat, I have to spend a certain amount of time in the engine room. It's just like that, you know. Uh, machinery and salt water just don't always go really well together. And sometimes it's an electrical relay stuck that I've got to find or it's uh, all the way to bigger problems like uh, uh, an air bubble in the uh, diesel fuel flow and I have to bleed the engine. But whatever it is, I spend a little bit of time of every boating day in the engine room. Sometimes it's nothing more than checking oil levels and water levels. But whatever it is, before I go into the engine room, I put on one of my favorite articles of clothing. Now, you're going to laugh at me. And uh, if you want to see a picture of me like this, just keep on wanting because that's not happening. Uh, the article of clothing is a one-piece overall. I have two of them. I have, it's a, a blue overall. It goes to my wrists and to my ankles. It's one piece and uh, it launders beautifully, comes out of the laundry, just looking crisp and fresh and wonderful. And it's got a, a long zip basically from, from crotch to neck. And you just sort of step into it, zip yourself up. It's the quickest way of getting dressed. It's fantastic. But I don't wear it all the time. I wear it while I'm in the engine room. Nothing to catch on any loose ends. It's, uh, it keeps uh, my clothing clean underneath. It's great. Anyway, that's purely utilitarian. I think Mao Tung used to wear one of those for state occasions for a while to sort of spread, express his egalitarian roots. And um, anyway, uh, that's purely utilitarian. How often do you dress purely for utilitarian purposes. Um, let me ask you this. Would you spend a little more for branded clothing, for clothing that comes from a certain designer, has a certain designer label on it, uh, but without talking yourself into the idea that it's of higher quality? Now, sometimes it is, of course. I, don't, uh, I, don't, I, I know that. But there are other times where, you know, a regular polo shirt costs $17 and one that has a little um, well I'm not going to single out any particular designer of any others but it has a little logo of a designer on the on the on the pocket well that's going to cost $32 or what, maybe not so much but whatever it is uh, is that a factor whether you are male or female is the designer a factor some people and and here I think it's liable to be more often women than men, but they just find that a certain designer's clothing works for them. It, it fits. So they go out of the way looking for that because the odds of finding something that just feels right uh, are higher. So I understand that, obviously. And I'm not, but none of these are judgmental questions. They, they you know, they don't make you a, a lesser person or a, a, a not so person so with me personally uh i'm happier with a uh, a no brand clothes i you know i'm just or i'll say a completely ordinary brand i'm 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 okay with that excepting with shoes uh with shoes i do use a particular brand of shoes mostly because I speak a lot, and uh, you might say to yourself, well, then he needs special mouth protectors. Why foot protectors? Well, because when I speak, 
I nearly always stand out of respect for my audience rather than sitting, lounging comfortably in a chair. I also find that the uh, sound that my mouth makes sounds a little bit better when I'm standing than when I'm sitting. So I'm on my feet, and therefore I do look for a certain branded shoe when possible. And when it comes to uh, my suits, again, I'm, I'm just, um, uh, I've come to find that there's a certain kind of suit that works best for me. It, do, it requires, uh, well, whatever, we, you don't need to, you know, I don't think you're very interested in that, whatever it is. But um, those are some of the questions that I ask you to contemplate. Would you do that? These questions, just think about these questions and um, how you respond to them and what your responses might tell you about your attitude towards clothing. Um, let's move on, shall we? Some more questions. Um, you know, you might be somebody who does adventurous vacations, right? I'm, I'm not into adventurous vacations. Um, I'm just not. Um, my, my day-to-day life, thank God, is, is more than adventurous enough. And so if I can take a vacation on, uh, on a boat with family for a, a, a little while, I can't ask for more than that. But many of you, uh, I know because I hear from you, do adventurous trips. Um, there's one couple, and you know who you are because you're probably listening. Uh, you've recently come back from a trip to Antarctica, and it was freezing cold, and you had to get off your ship and get down into little rubber Zodiac boats and go bouncing over the waves with the wind and the spray in your face in order to be able to come up close to sea lions and penguins and, uh, and, uh, and um, well, there were other animals as well. Uh, but it was, you know, far from comfortable. It was very unusual. It was a trip of a lifetime, and it's really not something that everyone would want to do. I know that Susan Lappin and me, uh, no, we just, you know, uh, give us a choice between um, a, a boating trip in British Columbia or a, uh, a, a, a guided tour to Antarctica. We're not even interested. Some of you have hiked up over 7,000 feet into the Peruvian Andes Mountains to see a pile of stones called the lost city of Machu Picchu. Okay, so as you can tell, I'm not in the least bit tempted. But that's just me. And I'm sure many of you aren't either. But some of you are because some of you have done that. So what I'm saying is that I know Right, we're all different. We all have different tastes, and uh, and there are many of you who listening to me now are saying, "Yeah, you know, I do pretty adventurous stuff. I do unusual vacations. I like doing things that uh, not everybody does." Okay, fine. In that case, are you ready to spend a nudist vacation? That would be a little bit different, right? You'll you'll go to a resort in one of the Caribbean islands. And you'll spend a week being totally nude. What do you say? Right? It's, you know, it's no less or more adventurous than going up the 7,000 feet into the Andes Mountains of South America in Peru. No, it's just a nice week on a sunny beach in a nice resort in, on a Caribbean island, except the whole thing is nude. Go on, give it a shot. Just like my friends who went to Antarctica, they said, oh, you know, give it a shot. Try it one day. You'll love it. No, I'm just not going to give it a shot. Thanks. Are you going to give a shot to the nudist beach? My guess is you probably are saying to that what I say to people who try to talk me into visiting the lost city of Machu Picchu. Not happening. No, absolutely not. So why not? Like, why are all kinds of adventure trips up for consideration? but not one on a nudist beach. I mean, do you have hang-ups about your body? Is that your problem? Do you have old, primitive, puritanical repressions? It's just the body is natural and wholesome. Go on, give it a shot, try a week of nudity. Somehow I have the feeling that this is a tougher sell than a visit to Antarctica 
or a visit up to the top of the Andes Mountains. Um, are, are these just um, views that were imposed on our society by old-time repressed Christians and that without them, we would be just like Jean-Jacques Rousseau said. We'd be noble savages. We'd be happy, natural, naked animals. Would, would that happen? Now, the reason that I, um, I'm asking you this question is because I was fascinated to ask it on our website. Some of you may not know that uh, Susan Lappin and I have a Facebook group called Friends of Rabbi Daniel and Susan Lappin. Now, I've heard from a number of people lately, uh, maybe like a dozen um, fr- you know, people who've, who've, who've been part of our activities uh, for the longest time, have just recently told Susan or told me that they they have nothing to do with Facebook. They don't want to have anything whatsoever to do with, with Facebook for a number of reasons that I'm not going to go into now. And so uh, I understand that and I respect that, and so that's a little tough. But for folks who do, um, there's a page, Friends of Rabbi Daniel and Susan Lappin, and I recently put up a poll there, uh, and the poll was a thought experiment, and it had to do with clothing, and uh, within a really within hours, about 200 people had responded, and there was a very strong preponderance in one direction over the other. Very interesting. Had to do with clothing. And uh, if you went on Facebook to our group page, Friends of Rabbi Daniel and Susan Lappin, you'd see it. But I'm going to tell it you. I'm going to tell you all about this, anyways. Um, before I do that, however. Um, there was a United Airlines captain, uh, worked for many years, was suspended for six months recently. His name is Andrew Collins. Let me tell you his story. Um, He was recently paid out $300,000 by the city of Denver for a wrongful arrest. What happened was, and you know, I think you can sympathize with this, um, the captain got off a flight and uh, went to where the where United Airlines had a deal with one of the airport hotels to rest up uh, before he was going to catch his next flight the next day. And so he goes into his hotel room at Denver Airport, and uh, he gets undressed, and he doesn't pull the blinds or anything. And it's the it's I, from what I gather, it's the middle of the daytime, and he's going to take a shower, and he, he wants to get some sleep. And and so he's walking around the room uh, nude, all right? I mean, I don't think he's the first human being in existence to walk around his hotel room naked in between getting undressed and getting into the bathroom for a shower. It happens. Um, do, do men do that more than women? <laughs> That's an interesting question. And for the life of me, I cannot figure out how to do that research. So I'm going to drop the line of inquiry. But it doesn't matter. The important thing is that uh, before he'd had a chance to get into the shower, there was a violent banging on the door. It was a sheriff from the city, and they were going to break down the door if he didn't open it. And the next thing is he was carted down to, uh, to the precinct and arrested for being for. Turns out, although he didn't realize, or he says he didn't realize that he could be seen from the terminal, and by the way, it was 100 yards away, so we're not talking about the next building. The ter- somebody in the terminal called the police because they could see him naked through the window of his hotel room. So um, uh, it sounds ludicrous and ridiculous to me. And it, the judge agreed also and ruled against the city. And uh, give give the man credit. You know, he, he didn't sue for ridiculous sums of money, which... He, um, he he certainly could have, but uh, he he uh, was awarded three hundred thousand uh, dollars, which, considering that because of the arrest, United Airlines just suspended him for six months, even though he was completely innocent. Uh, but that's somehow you know these things work that way sometimes, particularly with uh, employers like airlines that are so super hypersensitive to uh, uh, customer complaint. At any rate. 
So how do you feel about that? What about uh, nudity in general? How about in general? And, and I'm not going to go into the breastfeeding controversy. That's a whole separate discussion. But right now, how do you feel about uh, people being arrested? And I'm not even going to go into the male-female issue, right? Um, men walk around without shirts on. It's one thing. Women walk around without shirts on. And it is something entirely different. And if you don't get that, you're a moron. I mean, for heaven's sake, that doesn't need any explanation. But uh, bottom line, should there be such rules and laws? Does the state have an interest in making sure that we are clothed? Really? Or does the state have an interest in making sure I'm wearing a watch as well? And how about shoes? Does the state have an interest in making sure that my footwear is stylish and fashionable? What is this about? And so I ask you to dwell on that. Obviously, uh, you don't need me to tell you that. Obviously, I think that the state, as our representative, has an interest, as we all do, in um, public standards. And what is this public standard? Am I saying there's something embarrassing about the human body? Am I saying there's something shameful and needs to be covered up and I want laws to make sure that you do not enjoy the freedom of walking around nude and naked? Uh, What is this all about? And um, those are the issues and those are the questions that need resolving. And uh, the next thing I'm going to do is walk you through the thought experiment. I'll walk you through the thought experiment that I put up on our Facebook page, Friends of Rabbi Daniel and Susan Lappin, and um, and people. I put up a poll for people who give their answer. You will be able to give your answer of this as well. But um, first of all, I want to remind you that if you are listening to this podcast on time, well, then you still have time to join our master class. The way to find out more about this is maybe you want to just make a quick note to yourself or uh, or, uh, uh, bookmark it, and that is rabbidaniellappin.com forward slash master class, M-A-S-T-E-R-C-L-A-S-S, master class, Uh, or as Susan says it, master class. I, I can't say it like that. But uh, it's Rabbi Daniel Lappin forward slash masterclass. And uh, this is where we are redoing. We are uh, uh, doing a new edition of our book from two years before uh, 9-11. The book was called America's Real War. The subtitle is A Jewish Rabbi Insists That Judeo-Christian Values Are Vital for Our Nation's Survival. A main part of the book is explaining why the majority of self-identified Americans of Jewish ancestry are liberal. Uh, The book also challenges the Marxist orthodoxy that we are divided into groups based on skin color or gender or how much money we've got in the bank. No, that's not true at all. A low-class person isn't somebody with no money. I know plenty rich and low-class people. I also know many poor, uh, many, um, many poor high-class people. Uh, high-class and low-class have to do with how your children are growing up. If you are raising children who will be outstanding citizens in the next generation, you're a high-class person. What I mean by that is your children will be much richer than you are. That's what, raising, that's what living a high-class lifestyle is all about. You might be an immigrant, you might be working two jobs, but you make sure that your children are doing well at school, you might be sending them to private school, you might be homeschooling them, I know people in all those categories, Um, then you uh, are uh, making sure that your children may be doing something else like uh, music lessons, and you are you literally have no extra money to spare, no discretionary income whatsoever. You are a very high class person. But on the other hand, you could have all the money in the world. Uh, you could have gone through four marriages. Uh, you've got uh, a number of children with whom you have very little 
connection. There are children who don't have a lot to do with you and certainly um, do not share very much. Your children may do a lot better than you. Maybe they won't, but you are not a high-class person. And so what we talk about in this book is that if we're not divided by class having to do with money, we're not divided by skin color, we're not divided by gender, what are we divided by? And I explained in America's Real War, written in 99, uh, exactly what the fundamental uh, canyon and clash that cuts through American culture, who's on one side, who's on the other. And uh, uh, it's, it's a fascinating book. Um, it also made certain predictions about the direction in which things were going to go. Don't forget the book was written before there was homosexual marriage, before immigration was an issue, before Islam was an issue, um, before um, all the multiple genders, before um, boys were wrestling on girls' wrestling teams, before all those things. The book was written, and all of them were Um, prophetically revealed in terms of general principles. Now, this isn't because I'm a prophet. It isn't because I'm smart. It's because I really do understand ancient Jewish wisdom and how the world really works. And deploying those permanent principles of ancient Jewish wisdom, uh, that allows me or anybody else to understand the direction in which society is going. And that's all I did. But it certainly needs an update, and we're doing that uh, together with you. We're going to discuss the book online uh, with everybody who subscribes and joins this masterclass, and we're going to do it uh, for two evenings a week for five weeks. If you can't do some of those weeks, it doesn't matter because we'll just email you uh, and give you access to the video of the class So you'll be able to be there and see everyone's participation, even if you weren't actually able to do it in real time. And uh, and that's something that you can see more about by just going to our website. Go to rabbidaniellappin.com forward slash masterclass, and there you are. See you soon. We're starting actually this coming um, uh, Tuesday night. And uh, as I say, if you um, if we've already started and there's only three more weeks to go, you want to join anyway, you can still do it because you join. You'll then be given access to all the earlier as well. We'll be basically discussing together the socioeconomic um, security, all the trends of the United States of America and the rest of the world over the last few decades, and even more importantly, where is it all headed? So, uh, thought experiment now. You ready for the thought experiment? Okay, Uh, the thought experiment goes like this. Okay, here comes the thought experiment. Imagine that we take a little infant boy and a little infant girl, small little kids, really small, young, infants, and we put them on a remote and isolated but benign desert island. And let's stipulate that uh, they're perfectly safe there. There are are no threats of any kind. And uh, let's also stipulate that they are able to obtain food or or that there's some mechanism that provides them with food and... uh, Everything is safe. There, there, is, there is nothing there on the island that imperils them, and they survive. Um, don't ask me how it's possible for them to survive, because this is a thought experiment. They survive, okay? That's all there is to it. And we're going to set up clandestine surveillance equipment so as that we can watch what happens there over the next few centuries, Yes, centuries. This is a thought experiment. It's one of the great things of thought experiments. You don't have to be constrained by the ordinary natural laws of the world in which we live. Now, uh, let us ask ourselves, they're going to grow up, they're going to uh, reach um, a, an age of awareness Do you think it is likely that they are going to discover sexuality and reproduction? 
Uh, yeah, I mean, they may not initially recognize the connection, but whatever it is, over a period of time, I think we can quite safely acknowledge that uh, there are going to be more people. It's going to turn into a tribe of people on this island. I don't think there's any doubt about that at all. Um, okay, we keep watching. And over the period of time, do you think they're going to discover that the that there is a periodicity in time there's a cyclical quality to time with a period of 365 days. Right? Yeah. Yeah, they will. Because sooner or later, somebody will stick a, a, a branch in the sand at the beach and notice the way the shadow uh, processes during the course of 365 days. They'll get that. By the way, do you think they'll figure out a division of time of seven days qu and called a week now they don't know english they won't call it a week but will they have a seven day cycle think about that for a few minutes um, before you answer and i think you'll be surprised when you realize what that means what it says about the almost universal acceptance of a seven day week in our world all right um and here comes the main question of all the main question is, well, before I ask you the main question, here's the secondary question. Will they develop the idea of marriage? One man committing himself exclusively to one woman and devoting himself to supporting and protecting that woman and their children? Do you think that's likely to show up on our island? You can think about that. But now to the $64,000 question, as they used to say 100 years ago, uh, the question is, do you think that we will find them wearing clothes? Let me stress, there's absolutely no utilitarian reason for clothes. The weather is always exactly set at human body temperature. The weather never varies. It's always comfortable. And uh, there's no heat, there's no cold, there's no uh, hail storms. Everything is absolutely benign. Are they likely to wear clothes? Right? They're, you know, they're animals on the island. They can look at benign elephants. No elephants that charge like in the other island I told you about. Um, and they've got all, you know, kangaroos and cats and cows and camels, but all the animals are benign, like in a Disney movie. There's no, no problems at all. Uh, are they wearing clothing? That is really the big question to ask. And that's the uh, question I asked at our group page, Friends of Rabbi Daniel and Susan Lappin. And interestingly enough, uh, a very large number of people said yes they would be wearing clothing and a smaller number i'm thinking it was about a third when i last looked it was about a third of the respondents were saying no they will not be wearing clothing okay um well um i concede obviously that there is no way to prove that they will or will not be wearing clothing. It's a thought experiment, but there isn't a conclusion. Because in the comments, there were very interesting comments, about 50 people commented <clears throat> on that uh, poll on Facebook, and uh, people made some interesting points. You know, somebody said, well, ever since Adam and Eve, uh, people know that there's clothing. And my question would be, how about folks that never heard of Adam and Eve, right? There are many aboriginal cultures that uh, when the Western man first encountered, they knew nothing of these things. They didn't know about a flood store. They had none of this mythology of um, floods and animals or anything like that. Um, and by the way, many of them were not wearing clothes, when they were first encountered, often by Christian missionaries and often by trading ship, the crews of trading vessels. They were not wearing clothing. Some of them were wearing very basic clothing, some kind of a belt or loincloth around the central part of the body, but not elsewhere. 
So there were variations in what was discovered as the Western world ran up against the primitive cultures uh, during the 16, 17, 18, and 1900s. But uh, what is it? What are we likely to, to find on our desert island? Well, I would think that myself, I, my guess is that in the benign conditions I describe, uh, there may well be no clothing. Or, alternatively, it's quite possible that there will be that very basic belt, um, very elementary loincloth type thing, just something to cover the central part of the body. Um, why? Well, possibly, uh, and this was suggested by somebody um, who who wrote on the comment section on that question, on that thought experiment I put on our Facebook group, who made the point, well, that's the, the part of the body that exudes um, fluids, if you like. Um, and so that might have been a reason to keep it covered. All right, I, it's an interesting idea. I can, I can certainly hear that. Uh, we don't know for sure. But the very fact that it is a question, the very fact that we aren't sure, and by the way, the people who say, yeah, you'd probably find the children on the desert island as they evolve into a tribe, you'd probably find that they put clothing on. Uh, even those people would agree that, yes, it would be very basic clothing. And I'm quite sure right now listening, you are weighing up in your own mind whether this completely isolated culture that we have thought up uh, is going to come up with clothing or not, you think about it. And, and, and I, you know, I can hear it both ways. I don't think they're going to be wearing tuxedos. I don't think they're going to be wearing evening gowns. But it's possible they are wearing something very basic around the center part of the body. And I, I, I doubt that they'd be wearing anything more than that, men or women. I don't think they'd be wearing anything more than that. And I wouldn't be in the least bit surprised to discover that they're wearing nothing at all. That would not surprise me in the least. <laughs> well, what's going on here, I ask? Now, I have to do a little bit of a, a side excursion here, which I hope you will enjoy accompanying me on. But... Um, so I only a little while ago had a chance to see Mel Gibson's movie Hacksaw Ridge. Um, it's, it's hard for me to separate um, Mel Gibson's work from the person I know. Um, he's, he's been a good friend. Uh, I, I like him. Um, I, like all of us, like most of us, I should say, he has his demons. But the notion that Mel Gibson is an anti-Semite, I utterly and completely reject. Uh, he is a believing Catholic, and uh, and uh, but look, he's he's been he was he was very very sweet to my one of my daughters who was a fan of his work. I'm saying this because I just saw Hacksaw Ridge, uh, you know, not that long ago. And here's what struck me. And, and again, I want to try and be as objective as I possibly can. I do recognize that uh, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And I'm not going to say that any woman that I find beautiful is going to be a woman that every man necessarily finds beautiful. Right? Fortunately, that's not how the good Lord created the world. Uh, but however, in general, there are certain uh, basics. And, uh, uh, you know, I think that um, most men would find a, uh, a slender, well-proportioned woman uh, much more attractive than a, than a very large, overweight woman doesn't mean that large overweight women are not entitled to human dignity, obviously, but I'm talking about something very basic, men's attraction to women. Um, is it only a question of body type? 
And my answer to that is no. It is also a function of how uh, they are presented, how they appear, how they are dressed, how they are got out. And that would appear to be fairly basic. But to me, this is where it gets interesting. The female lead in uh, Hacksaw Ridge is a, an Australian actress called Teresa Palmer. And uh, she is a beautiful woman, uh, happens to be blue-eyed and blonde, which I think is probably also a widely, um, a, a widely accepted stereotype, um, partially because they are rare. Those are recessive genes and, uh, and, uh, and, and are a little bit more rare, but there, there may be other factors as well, but not for now. Uh, for now is that um, I thought this is interesting. In the movie, uh, she is where the movie is set in 1942, and so she's wearing clothing from 1942, and I I think she looks remarkable. Meanwhile, I thought let's see what she looks like in contemporary uh, clothing, and so I wa it was not hard to find a few photographs of Teresa Palmer at red carpet appearances, and I. I chose those preferably because, first of all, it's contemporary. It's how she would would appear according to today's fashions, and she's presumably going to be wearing uh, very the, the very best clothing available, the best designer clothing, and she's going to have had her hair and her makeup done professionally. Uh, and you can also look at pictures from her modeling portfolio. And what I was primarily interested in was the difference between Teresa Palmer uh, looking the way she looked in, or would have looked in 1942, long before she was born, and the way she looks in contemporary times. And I was very struck by that. I was also struck by a beautiful movie that Susan Lappin and I saw recently called Ladies in Black. Uh, Bruce Beresford is an absolutely incredibly talented Australian movie director and um, he did this movie uh, set in a Sydney department store in about 1959 and uh, it stars a number of wonderful Australian actresses um, some of the the women acting in it are uh, Julia Ormond, Anjuri Rice, Rachel Taylor most notably and again, I thought, okay, this would be an interesting opportunity for me to take a look at a comparison between the appearance of some admittedly beautiful women, but got up the way they would have looked in 1959, and to compare that with the way they look when they are got up now in, uh, in the very best of ways, according to contemporary standards and, and current norms. And what does one find? Now, again, this is subjective. I'm telling you what your rabbi found. However, I'm also going to say that I think that a majority of men would agree. When you look at the depiction of women in the 1940s and 50s, it is very different and more appealing than women in the 2020s or even 2010s. Carrying my experiment just a little bit further, I thought it would be interesting to compare the way women looked in fashion magazines of the 1950s and 60s, you know, like Vogue magazine, compared with the way the women look in those same magazines today. And what do I find? I find that there has been a steady trend, a steady move from very feminine-looking women, very feminine-looking women. And each of you will be able to interpret the meaning of that word in your own way. But in broad terms, we'll all agree. I think you will see 
that women in uh, depicted in uh, movies of you know 1940s 1950s early very early 60s in general much more feminine than now fashion magazines uh, look at the advertising in these magazines today and a large number of them uh, you find the models looking almost androgynous almost unisexual to the extent it's almost as if the photographers and the designers were aiming for a look which if you just looked at the face shield away the uh, from above the forehead and below the neck uh, you would actually not be sure if you're looking at a man or a woman but if you go back to the earlier period pre-1960 62 63 64 uh, women look very feminine. Now, the same is true with men, by the way. Um, I don't want to sort of be guilty of the old Marlboro man stereotype, but back then, men were men. <laughs> you know, so, and yes, you looked at advertisements and men looked manly. Uh, today, you look at fashion magazines and the men look androgynous, unisexual. It's almost as if those in charge of designing, fashion, marketing, clothing, uh, they're somehow on the cutting edge of the avant-garde, and that somehow or another, in the same way that out there in the culture, whether it's Berlin or Paris or London or New York or Los Angeles, the style in the culture is, you know, men and women, It's not. there's no big difference. They're all the same. And if a man wants to declare himself a woman or vice versa, no problem. Uh, back to the idea of men wrestling on the women's team, men joining, men racing in the women's bicycle races. It's fine because our fundamental conviction is that there's no difference between men and women. And sure enough, as we look at clothing fashions that parallel this cultural evolution, or devolution may be more accurate, what we find is that the pictures show exactly the same thing. Back in magazines in the 40s and 50s and early 60s, like, you know, Life magazine, even National Geographic, and many other of the popular magazines in America, including, by the way, magazines like uh, Popular Science and Popular Culture, you could see advertisements of men and women. By the way, it was very, very common. You'd see advertisements might be for kitchen appliances or, or anything. You'd see women wearing aprons. Today, you don't. That's another change. Um, the women did look more feminine than they do in general in advertisements today. It's, uh, it's clothing. It's hairstyle. It's just the general appearance. And then I also took a look at some of the advertisements in general from the 40s, 50s, and 60s uh, up to the present time. And in my mind, I don't have any doubt whatsoever. Now, you may uh, explore this if you're interested, and you'll let me know what you find. But in my mind, there is no doubt whatsoever that... Um, uh, Fe women were m presented much more in a much more feminine way in both movies and advertisements in that period than in the current period. Um, whether whether a man finds it more attractive or not, I don't know how universal that is. I don't. <laughs> You know, I don't spend a lot of time in conversation with uh, guys in focus groups analyzing the attractiveness of women in advertisements, although maybe I should. But uh, bottom line is that, uh, to me, there's been a decline in the femininity appearance of women, and uh, similarly with men as well, and, uh, and that the uh, clothing and styles and just general depiction um, the 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 look is more masculine in women, or at the very least more unisexual, more androgynous, more almost as if it's gender neutral. Okay, uh, I would say also that uh, and and this uh, the, the certain things. I mean, a lot of what I'm saying is is opinion. Some of it isn't. For example, when I tell you that advertisements from earlier magazines in the 40s, 50s, early 60s 
the overwhelming majority of women were depicted in dresses or skirts, whereas in contemporary times that moves to pants. That's another difference. And again, if you think about it, it is a feminine-masculine distinction, fairly obviously. And um, it was you know, it, it, that's one of the reasons that the Queen, and I, I don't know if this is still true for the royal family, probably isn't, looking at the royal family such as it is today, uh, but certainly the Queen was never photographed riding a horse, anything other than side saddle, both her legs on the same side of the horse, not riding astride the horse. Uh, partially that allows her to ride wearing a dress or a skirt rather than pants. Reason? more modest, more feminine, right? Modesty is a feminine attribute. It's not a masculine attribute. It's something I've spoken about before. Uh, not only do we find that in clothing catalogs, women's clothing often uses the words modesty, like lined for modesty. Uh, in men's clothing catalogs, the word modesty never, ever shows up. And the good Lord in creating men and women created us in exactly that same way where women's sexual organs are if you like modestly invisible whereas with men uh, they are rather arrogantly and prominently on display as it were there is no modesty at all about male genitalia that's just how we've been created as a reflection of an innate quality which sort of leads back to an earlier question. So am I suggesting that by their very nature, women would be inclined to want to cover themselves, even if they had no cultural reference points to Western civilization or biblical civilization? That is an interesting question. I obviously do not know the answer to that. But as I said earlier, I wouldn't be shocked in the slightest if that is exactly what might happen on our island culture. And so where do we go from here? Well, obviously, in that way, pants are less modest than dresses and skirts. Why? It's very simple. It's because uh, men's eyes are drawn automatically uh, to the uh, junction of women's legs. That's where men's eyes are drawn, if they are given the option. And um, pants are less modest in the sense that that junction is more defined, depending on the kind of pants or the kind of uh, whatever the garment is, more or less defined, whereas the whole advantage of a skirt or a dress is that, uh, that that junction is completely obscured and not presented for male gaze at all. So, uh, you know, for that reason, although obviously when they would grow up, we understood and accepted that each of our daughters would make their own decision, but um, at the time we were raising our daughters, we raised them to wear only dresses and not pants. And we explained the reason was very basic and real and fundamental. This wasn't made up. This wasn't religious puritanical uh, repression. This was a very, very real thing conforming to the feminine nature of one half of humanity. And... Uh, and I must tell you, it's, it's sort of, it's, you know, we still run into friends, harbour masters, people in British Columbia who remember uh, when our daughters were little. And they said, you know, you always stood out because after you docked, six little girls would climb down onto the dock and they were all wearing dresses like they were the only females in the entire harbour wearing dresses and not pants. But, uh, but that's what we did. And, and that's how it was. Uh, were there occasional exceptions? Sure, if you're going to be climbing, let's say you arrive in at a, a high harbor wall in a rubber boat, you bring your boat up to the foot of the wall, and you've got to climb up a, uh, a metal ladder bolted into the harbor wall to get up onto the quay. And, uh, you know, they're fine under those circumstances. Then um, what Susan taught our daughters to do was wear pants under their dresses. And uh, they also skied that way, by the way, uh, with dresses over their pants. It's just, you know, it was our family's 
um, system of adhering to the fundamental bond between uh, the biblical depiction of reality and the biological and physical reality of how we were created. Now we come to a very interesting piece of the Bible. And again, I know that we have many listeners to this show who are not uh, Bible aficionados, not uh, not Bible believers. I understand all that. However, I remind you as always that the Bible is without doubt the most influential volume in the sculpting of civilization. And apart from anything else, we are living today in a generation, in a time of the greatest level of biblical illiteracy in the history of civilization. Truly, at no earlier time in American history or European history do more important and influential people know less about the Bible. It's true. So, at the very least, at the very least, consider what I'm about to impart as my public service to improve the level of general education in society around the world, because I'm very, very conscious, particularly as I look at my map with all the different pins in it, I'm very, very aware that uh, we are blessed to have listeners to this show in so many different parts of the world, and I love that. Uh, But at any rate, let's go to uh, Genesis chapter 3, verse 7. Adam and Eve have eaten on the fr- of the fruit. I'm not going to go into the uh, the serpent or any of the details now, because the only thing I'm focused on is verse 7, chapter 3 of Genesis. And the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together, and they made for themselves belts. Now, this would tend to support... Uh, or at least be part of the discussion I mentioned earlier when I said that a most basic kind of loincloth is, uh, is I, I could contemplate the possibility of that arising uh, intuitively among people isolated from cultural input. Uh, not more than that, but that is the basic. So Adam and Eve are here depicted, and please understand, I'm not talking about this now as history. Uh, This is not a storybook. This is God's instruction manual for humanity, if you like. Okay, this isn't the history of the automobile. This is the book you find in the glove box in a high-quality car. Uh, In an ordinary car, you just get a a CD disc or you're told where to go online to get the manual. But the nice, big, fat, printed manual with every detail of your car's operation, that's what the book is that we're calling the Bible. And so uh, it's not about a, an attempt to concretize in your mind or visualize what was happening in the Garden of Eden. That is for children at Sunday school. But for adults, we have to treat this as almost mathematical presentations. So we look at chapter 3, verse 7. Adam and Eve took, uh, they dis- having bitten of the, eaten of the fruit, uh, their innocence was stripped They know that they're naked, and they stitch for themselves belts out of fig leaves. Okay, fine. So now they're covered. Everything is cool, right? No problem. Excepting something rather interesting, which is that towards the end of chapter 3 in Genesis, we find that uh, the verse 21 says, uh, and let me just make sure I'm translating exactly accurately from the Hebrew, and the Lord God made for the man and for his wife, cloaks, garments, clothing of leather, and he dressed them. Well, they were already dressed. Why did Adam and Eve not say to God, hey, Lord, you know, we appreciate the effort, but hey, no need. We've already got these beautiful threads, and what's more, they're green, right? Get that? You caught that, right? And so they're wearing fig leaves. No problem. We really don't need you to make any extra garments. No. Uh, If that conversation did take place, it wasn't recorded because God would simply have said to them, uh, you can toss away those uh, fig leaf belts you've got. 
uh, you are now going to be wearing leather clothing. That's very interesting. Here's another enormous difference. And this is a difference that is not that clear in the English, but is stupendously and brilliantly and incandescently clear in the Hebrew. Back in chapter 3, verse 7, it is, uh, their eyes were opened and they knew they were naked, and they sewed for themselves belts. The Hebrew is very clear that the two garments they made were identical. What Adam made and what Eve made, or what they made for both of them, were identical. They both wore basic belts, which, by the way, is exactly what the Bushmen in Namibia, in the in southwest, what used to be Southwest Africa, uh, what they were found to be wearing when um, they were discovered. And I'm pretty sure that for the most part, they were discovered as late as the 20th century. Uh, one of the people, well, I, I won't go into that. Uh, bottom line is, uh, men and women dressed the same, loincloths, belts, that's what they were wearing. But if you look at the Hebrew in Genesis chapter 3, verse 21, it's God made a totally separate outfit for Adam and a totally separate outfit for Eve. They looked different from one another. So if you like, the, the garments they made for themselves were unisexual. They were androgynous, same for men, same for women, basically ignoring male-female differences. But when God made their leather outfits totally different, for a start, it's quite possible that Adam's was more cut away. Eve's had a full top section, sculpted, shaped, fashioned, beautifully made by God himself, but quite different from the one for Adam. And so two very important points come out of this, folks. Number one, the intention intuitive way of making clothes doesn't focus on any difference between men and women. And sure enough, uh, throughout most of Southern Africa, including many, many, many parts that I traveled in with my family as a child, uh, the women wore nothing above the belt. They just wore the, the belt, and they, the men wore a belt. The men did wear the same thing as the women. And women's breasts were completely visible, that there was no attempt um, to, to, to hide them in any way whatsoever, which, you know, as an 11-year-old boy, uh, you know, let's say I noticed. So that is, you know, th what chapter 3 of Genesis verse 7 shows. Male and female clothing the same. Uh, God says in chapter 3 verse 21, nothing doing. It is very important to distinguish between male and female. Well, why is it so important to distinguish between male and female? Well, one of the reasons is, well, I, I attribute it to a woman I've never yet met, but gosh, I'd sure like to meet her. her she's a professor. She lives in Philadelphia. Her name is Camille Paglia, and um, she wrote a book called Sexual Personae. Uh, when I say a book, this is like an old-fashioned Manhattan telephone directory. It's a big book. Uh, the subtitle is Art and Decadence, From Nefertiti to Emily Dickinson, which is a very, very um, enchanting uh, subtitle. In that book, she had a sentence which gripped me in a way that nothing gripped me the same way that particular day. I froze because it got me. Here's what she said. If civilization had been left in female hands, we would still be living in grass huts. And she explained on that, although I didn't need much more explanation. I got it. She was absolutely right. And she was affirming fundamental truths from ancient Jewish wisdom that I knew, but I had never expressed as effectively as Camille Paglia did in Sexual Personae. If civilization had been left in female hands, we would still be living in grass huts. You know why? Because we guys are driven to performance by the presence of women in our lives. I, I can't put it more blatantly or realistically than that. If there was no women around we wouldn't build anything. And likewise, 
because we are there to build and because in general we are better engineers than women we like being engineers for the most part i know there are exceptions i know exceptions i i have exceptions in my family but for the most part most women do not desire to be engineers they don't desire to be builders not a lot of female bricklayers a lot of guys enjoy laying bricks like winston churchill by the way uh, clementine churchill no winston churchill yes we get a kick out of building things by the way we also get a kick out of uh, a kick out of blowing things up and destroying things that is also true our job as uh, men in the lord's image is to focus on that part of ourselves that in that uh, loves building things and trying to diminish that part of our personality that enjoys breaking and destroying things but uh, both those areas appeal much more to male than to female builders and breakers creators and destroyers i'm not going to use the word creators because uh, women are just or sometimes in in the most important way of all perhaps more creative than men but um but uh okay fine well nonetheless um camille paglia if civilization had been left in female hands we would still be living in grass huts because women alone would not build skyscrapers men alone would not either it's only the presence of women to admire us and to reward us and to smile at us admiringly that makes us build skyscrapers and spaceships and cars and railroads and buildings and medicine and cures and everything else we do for the, are there exceptions yeah of course there are but in general uh, we do things because of sexual tension um, you may not like that particular phrase in which case i'll withdraw it but I'm, what I'm trying to suggest is that, th and here I, I'm going to put it very bluntly, the more you erode the distinction between male and female, the more you make men the same as women and women the same as men, the less men will be impelled towards masculinity and creativity and building and accomplishment and achievement. And the more you blend and blur the male-female distinction, the less women will be driven to be feminine and to be the kind of women that inspire men to great achievement. So, as we find that uh, those people primarily engaged in the fashion industry, designing clothes, marketing clothes, popularizing clothes, promoting clothes, uh, the people who uh, work at Vogue magazine, uh, in general, the people who are designers tend to be people on the cutting edge of the avant-garde, as I say. They tend to be uh, more likely the people who will be um, hospitable to um, cultural ideas such as the obliteration of distinction between the sexes. And so, not surprisingly, in these areas of high fashion, yeah, I, I'm not surprised that we find the lowering of femininity, the lowering of masculinity, and the blurring and bringing together of a kind of common, the kind of clothing that sort of anybody can wear, male or female, jeans and t-shirts. But who are they for, men or women? Yeah, that's right. Um, and so if I can use as a metaphor uh, hydroelectric power, what is hydroelectric power? What happens is you build a dam across a river, and the river is blocked by the dam, and so the water behind the dam begins to rise. And on some of the more uh, sophisticated and brilliant hydroelectric dams and i love visiting them the most recent one i visited was grand coulee dam in um the west in in eastern washington state um the hoover dam near las vegas they're amazing constructions things by the way that america hasn't built for decades and decades and decades 
And uh, the way these things work, and, uh, and you can see them in other parts of the world as well, particularly in Asia and Africa, uh, fantastic dams being built. You find that so the water rises and rises and rises and uh, spreads out, covers areas. And so you have huge volumes of water constrained behind the wall. But the important thing is you might have the water, you know, like 200 feet high. So if you're on a boat on one side of the dam wall, you are 200 feet higher, 300 feet higher than you would be if you were on a boat on the river below the dam wall. So um, why is this important? Because what they have at the base of the dam wall are pipes that let water come through. But on the way through, they have to spin a turbine, which is like a wheel with paddles. Think of an old-fashioned paddle wheel, although it's designed in a far more efficient and sophisticated way. So uh, in the same way that in old-fashioned mills in the uh, 17th century in, in, in early America, and of course throughout the Industrial Revolution in England and before, uh, the only form of power was moving water. So the water moved past a paddle wheel, and the wheel turned, and it could be used to grind wheat into flour, its earliest usage. Well, here in the dam, embedded inside the dam wall are these paddle wheels called turbines and the water comes pouring out of them and the pressure of the water is a function of how high the water is on one side of the dam wall. The turbine spins with incredible force and the turbine is connected by its axle to the axle of a generator and cities like Las Vegas derive their electricity. And if you don't know it's effective, just go to the strip in Las Vegas, Las Vegas Boulevard at night, and see all the lights, and you'll know that that comes from the spinning turbines at uh, Hoover Dam. It's rather remarkable. Now, somebody might come along and say, I don't like the separateness. I don't like the idea that there should be water high on one side of the dam wall and low on the other. I'm going to equalize the water height on both sides. And they do that. And what happens to the turbines? They slow down and come to a standstill. No more generation of energy. Generation of energy depends upon a difference. Generation of energy depends upon distinction. Right? The only reason that your starter in the car will start your engine when you put your finger on the button is because there is a battery under the hood with two terminals, a positive and a negative. And the difference between them happens to be 12 volts. In the socket in your wall, there are two terminals, and the difference between them is 110 volts. Okay, You want energy, there's got to be a difference. You've got to have high water on one side of the dam, low water on the other, and away we go. It really works. In the same way, if you want energy in human society, you've got to have masculine and feminine. And these devolving trends that blur the distinction and make women less female, less feminine, and make men less masculine, and that's being done all the time right now, by the way, in American society in particular, not so much in Africa, not so much in other parts of Asia that I've visited, but in America in particular, to its to its uh, tragic outcome, American culture tries to undermine masculinity. Even phrases like toxic masculinity and Uh, being a man and men do all these horrible bad things. Yeah, they also build skyscrapers and they build factories and uh, all those fabrics you like turning into clothing, those fabrics wouldn't exist if there were not factories to make them. And those factories, yep, built by men mostly. That's right. You need men and women and you need men to be masculine and you need women to be feminine. And the truth is, although they're frightened to admit it today, most men desire feminine women and most women desire masculine men. In terms of the real meanings of those terms, feminine doesn't mean weak, masculine doesn't mean brutish and cruel, and I'm not going to take the time, I'm not going to insult you because I think you're all sophisticated enough to understand 
what in its purest and highest form masculinity and femininity mean. But uh, clothing is one of the most important ways of maintaining sexual tension. Now, I asked earlier if you'd like to spend a week on a nudist beach. And the answer for me is absolutely not. I mean, firstly, I'd be profoundly uncomfortable. But even more than that, I wouldn't find it attractive. For me, and I know that I'm not alone in this, part of the attractiveness of a woman is the concealment, is the demureness, is the modesty. And that's one of the big differences between women's fashions of the 1940s and women's fashions of the 2000s, a big difference. But uh, that is a crucial thing. Uh, People who uh, have written on these topics speak about the almost absence of sexual tension in a nudist beach. It's not there for the most part because there is nothing concealed. The concealment is part of it. And so God said to Adam and Eve, apparently, you're going to have to have clothes, but they've got to be different. They've got to be male-female clothes. And clothes have these different distinctions. Let's stipulate for the moment that uh, obviously clothes have a utilitarian function. Uh, They do provide protection from the weather. No question about it. And uh, if you tie this into the biblical injunction during the sixth day of creation to spread out over the earth and subdue the earth, and that means cure disease, Uh, turn swamps into farmland, all of these things, in order to be able to do that, you're going to have to go to places where the climate is not so benign. And so part of fulfilling our mandate as human beings to subdue the planet doesn't mean to destroy it, doesn't mean to be a bad steward, it means to subdue it. To do that, we need clothing, obviously, Uh, the clothing that is appropriate to tropical climates where people are building highways and bridges in Africa and clothing for cold climates where uh, scientists are doing research in Antarctica. Yeah, of course, clothing has utilitarian value. Is that the only reason we wear clothing? Of course not. If If it was, we'd all just be wearing overalls. Absolutely not. So, other diff- other important roles for clothing, well, it shows the distinction between humans and animals. We are created in the image of God, and uh, we are established a- as masters of creation. We are over the rest of the world. It's our job to take care and develop and make the rest of the world safe and productive. That's what we do. And so we distinguish and we show that difference. We emphasize it by putting clothing on us and not on animals. Uh, Putting clothing on animals is is being silly, right? But I think part of it is not being comfortable with this distinction. And part of the development of socialism, the development of secular fundamentalism, what we call leftism or liberalism, very often has as its roots eroding the distinction between animals and people and eroding the distinction between male and female. It's fundamental part of it. And civilization doesn't work. The more that we think of ourselves as animals, the less we are capable of restraining our appetites and refocusing our energies from indulging those appetites to building civilization, building families, building factories, building, planting forests, and having everything that grows out of men and women being productive, men and women being driven by one another, but in an entirely positive way, protective of one another at all times. That is the biblical vision. Can you perhaps now see how we are moving towards the hypothesis I presented to you at the beginning, that clothing is not here because people got civilized? No, we got civilized because of clothing. So leaving aside, the, for me, the least important aspect of clothing, namely protection from inclement weather, 
Now I move to the really important parts of clothing, distinguishing us from animals, making us different from animals, um, allowing us to maintain dignity. That's right. One of the reasons that when new recruits show up in the military, in most countries of the world, they strip them. Because when you take away the clothing, you take away the dignity. And they don't want people to think of themselves as dignified individuals. In the army, the idea is to convert dignified individuals into members of the team. And so they strip and they make them very comfortable with nudity. In some armies and in some places, they make them comfortable with taking care of all bodily functions in public, no privacy. In other words, it is animalistic. I understand the purpose, militarily-wise, of course. I get that. But uh, it is, at the same time, a very real part of what's going on. Um, during the uh, Nazi subjugation of Europe and their attempt to wipe out my people entirely, one of the things they did was they brought them into the camps and they immediately stripped them. What was that for? You're going to kill them anyway. So why not let them maintain their dignity to the very end? You're going you're gonna to put them in gas chambers and then put them in ovens. So why not let them wear their clothing? Because the idea was to destroy them, to make it absolutely impossible for them to revolt or for them to resist in any way. When you destroy a human being's dignity, there's really not a lot left. And so ancient Jewish wisdom focuses enormously on doing everything possible to preserve the dignity of human beings. By the way, the entire Bible approach to charity, to helping other people, could not be more different from Western society's tendency to turn uh, charity recipients into permanent dependence through welfare systems and entitlement systems. And uh, what it does is it destroys dignity, and with that goes a collapse of cultural norms. It happens in every country. It happens to everybody. And so enormous emphasis on protecting the dignity of people who need help for a period of time. And uh, so beyond that, uh, next role of garments, to emphasize the distinction between male and female, between man and woman, right? Very, very important. That doesn't appear in the context of any other species during the story of creation. In chapter one, you find that God makes all the animals with no mention of any difference between lions and lionesses and male camels and female camels, nothing. God just made all the species. And then finally, in uh, it comes to the sixth day of creation, and God made human beings, male and female, he created them. That's the very first time you hear those terms. Sexual difference is unimportant with animals. Sexual difference is vital and crucial for human civilization, which is what the Bible is all about developing and maintaining. And uh, how about we get to chapter 2? Chapter 2, we find that uh, uh, chapter 2, verse 7, we have God creating Adam. And uh, it says, and uh, the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground but in verse 19, it's out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field. And so to the reader of the English language, it sounds as if they're exactly the same, doesn't it? God formed man out of the dust of the earth. God formed the beasts out of the dust of the earth, right? Accepting everybody needs a rabbi, right? And some of you hear me say that and you say, ah, he's just trying to stay employed. And yes, I do want to stay employed. You're exactly right about that. But I'm also telling you how the world really works. And that is that in the Hebrew original, the word for used for God forming human beings is spelled quite differently from the way the word for God forming animals is spelled. When God forms Adam out of the dust of the earth, the word has extra letter that designates holiness and God's presence. That is, in other words, the creation of the human soul. 
when it comes to the forming of animals, that's absent. No such thing as that soul when it comes to, uh, uh, to the beasts of the field. And again, when it comes to the forming of the animals, no mention of male and female, just all the animals. But when God forms man, he looks and says, not good for man to be alone, right? That, that famous, famous phrase. And, um, and God looks and says, not good for man to be alone. And so he goes ahead and uh, creates Eve as well in order for, uh, for her to become part of the whole pattern. Adam would never have been who he has to be without Eve and, uh, and vice versa with, uh, with um, Eve wouldn't have been without Adam. Obviously, there it goes. Okay, I'm not going to, I'm not going to walk you through many more of those verses because you can do that for yourself, those of you who are interested, and you will see that uh, clothing is vital. Clothing helps to distinguish between male and female. Clothing gives us dignity. Clothing, clothing distinguishes us from animals, and those three things are absolute necessities for human beings to develop civilization. And so the question is not whether a baby boy and a baby girl left on the remote isolated island would develop clothing after they developed civilization. No, it's more a question of if they have clothing, there is a much higher probability of them developing a civilization as well. Wow, what a difference that makes. Clearly, today we live in a culture both in Europe and uh, in the United States, where tragic North America, I should say, Canada's not immune. Tragically, as a result of what's been happening since about the early 1960s, all what we call progress, brought about by the progressives of Western civilization, has uh, consisted of abandoning the underlying beliefs and conditions that 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 are the principle that are the foundation of clothing and as i said the people who design and make and sell clothing are generally speaking almost always members of the class who have gone the furthest who have gone the furthest in abandoning earlier beliefs abandoning all those beliefs that built europe that built United Kingdom, that built Canada, that built the United States of America. It's those people in the fashion industry who, for the most part, are not interested in that. They've abandoned those. And they, along with many others in the elites of university academia and particularly politics and, to a large extent, entertainment, and there's a lot of overlap. It's not an accident that leftist politicians like hanging out with folks in entertainment and fashion. That's right. Look, if you want to identify the major distinction between these two groups of people, and I cover this distinction in America's real war, um, it's a question of that the folks in this new class, the ruling elite, whether it's the people who wanted Great Britain to be part of Europe, or whether it's a people in the United States of America who loathe and despise President Trump, by and large, yes, I know there are exceptions, but by and large, within the bounds of generalities, people in that category no longer believe in any morally meaningful distinctions between human beings and animals. Let me just say that again clearly. These people no longer believe in morally meaningful distinctions between humans and animals. These people generally reject the idea of human beings being in charge of the planet, that the planet is here for our benefit. Obviously, we have to look after it, but we certainly do not have to subject human interests in the interests of the planet, as if it had its own independent, godly existence, Mother Earth. No, not at all. So uh, people on the left tend to reject any idea of human lordship over Earth. Most importantly, 
They tend to reject distinctions between men and women. And they also reject distinctions between children and adults to some extent. And so whatever other purposes clothing might have in terms of uh, uh, utilitarian value, in terms of um, uh, class boasting, these traditional functions of clothing have been eroded to the detriment of civilization and, in fact, imperiling and threatening civilization as well. And so, yes, if I were to go back and ask you those questions again that we asked at the beginning, what decides how you dress? Is it just comfort, appearance, fashion, and style? It's a lot of things. Clothing protect my dignity. They also protect me from the weather, but it is also a... Uh, uh, it, it has a great deal to do with how I interact with other people. It also is how I interact with myself. I view myself with more dignity when I am dressed than when I'm naked. I approach my work more seriously when I'm wearing a suit than when I'm wearing pajamas. And so clothing is as much for me as it is for other people. Um Overalls, I love my overalls. They are exactly the appropriate clothing for certain circumstances. Will I spend more for branded clothing that is not necessarily more durable or better than others? Probably not, but I understand that doing so has nothing utilitarian about it to do. It's all spiritual. It's part of a desire to connect with other people. I wear clothing by a certain designer because the people I like and admire wear the clothing of that designer. When I wear that clothing, I feel connected with them. I'm not judging this. I understand this. This is part of being a human being. Should public nudity be illegal and prevented by state power? Absolutely. Of course. Because it is in my interest and your interest for civilization to be maintained. And clothing plays a fundamentally important and vital and indispensable role in building and maintaining civilization. All of which has at its root human dignity created in the image of God. And all of the building of civilization, all the dirty work that has to be done for there to be civilization, building of sewers, making sure that human waste is carried out of our awareness and away from us so as we can preserve our dignity. That work done by men. You know why? Because they are women looking up to them. That's why they're doing it. And so, ladies and gentlemen, that brings us not to the end of the topic by any means, but uh, to the end of any reasonable claim that I can have on your attention. It's been a longer than usual show for which I ask your forgiveness, and I hope that you will nonetheless be able to enjoy it, even if not at one sitting, obviously. But uh, if you can join us for the masterclass on America's real war, and you'd like to do that, you'll be in video contact with Susan and I. You'll be able to write us uh, instant messages to which we will respond during the uh, video sessions twice a week for five weeks. Anyway, for more information, just go to rabbidaniellappin.com forward slash masterclass, M A S T E R. C-L-A-S-S, one word, master class. Uh, okay, that's it. And uh, as far as we can go, I, I'm sad to take my leave. I love my opportunities to be together with you. Always let me know where you're listening from. I take a childlike delight in that. I know it's silly, but I can't help it because I just get a kick out of the fact that my work is bringing together people from all around the world with the magic and marvels of modern technology. So thanks for being part of the show. Thank you, as always, for extending the reach of the show. Do tell folks about it. I appreciate it. Again, I take a childlike delight in measuring our downloads to see how many people are listening. Can't help it. I like it. It means that our teachings of ancient Jewish wisdom are reaching more people. More people are finding it useful. And that means I am being of service 
to more children of God. And I love doing that. Thanks so much. Have a wonderful week of good times with your finances, your family, and your friends and your faith. We'll be together again next week, God willing. I'm Rabbi Daniel Lapp, and your rabbi, God bless.